But how many generations, you know, get used to Welcome this? to the Anarchist Science Research Group Science video series, Science where today we've got historian Zoe Baker back to talk to us about anarchist strategy and values and her body of research. Check out part one below and don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Historically, anarchism was underpinned by a value system which was constituted by three interdependent values, which were freedom, equality and solidarity. And anarchists thought that you couldn't understand one in isolation from the other, because in order to realise any one of those values, you have to realise all three at once. So you need all three uh, together in order for any one of them to actually be realised over an extended period of time within society. So I'll now go through and briefly explain what they meant by freedom, equality and solidarity. So there are lots of different definitions of freedom offered by historical anarchists, and I'll just focus in on three of the main ones, but it should be kept in mind there are, there are some kind of obscure examples which fall outside these three. So the first one is defining freedom in terms of non-domination. What this means is that individuals are free if they are not subordinate to another person who has the power to impose their will on them. If a person is subject to the power of another, then even if this power is not currently being exercised, they are being dominated. And so to be free is to be able to live in accordance with one's will, rather than being subject to the will of another. This is a conception of freedom that anarchists got from republicanism, people who want to overthrow authoritarian monarchies in favour of a republic which grants people various rights and freedoms. And anarchism in many countries developed out of republicanism, and so they reject the state as a means to achieve positive social change, but they, a lot of them retain the definition of freedom as non-domination from these previous social movements. The second definition of freedom a lot of anarchists used was having the real possibility to do and or to be. So the idea is, is that an individual's freedom increases as the possible doings and beings which they can actually experience increases. And doings and beings are just literally things you can do or be. So, you know, you can become a physically fit person or you can do the activity of reading. And the more opportunities you have to do these various things or be these various things, the, the freer you are. So Emma Goldman, for example, writes that true liberty is not a negative thing of being free from something. Real freedom, true liberty is positive. It is freedom to something. It is the liberty to be, to do, in short, the liberty of actual and active opportunity. So, for example, when a government shuts down public libraries on this view, this is making people unfree because their opportunity to go to the library and read books is being taken away by it being shut down. Or if people don't have health care, then they're not free because they lack the opportunity to be healthy, to not die of various diseases and so on. So it's a view of freedom that very much connects it with having the actual means to act, rather than some kind of abstract notion where you have the right to do various things and therefore are free. Uh, they rejected this and thought that real freedom means actually being able to do things. Now the third and final main view on freedom was human development. So they defined freedom in terms of individuals engaging in activities and in so doing, transforming themselves such that they become a better version of themselves. Bakunin, for example, says that freedom consists in the full development of all the material, intellectual and moral powers which are found in the form of latent capabilities in every individual. On this view, one of the main ways that, for example, working in a factory makes people unfree is that it forces them to engage in the same actions over and over again. And you could say, say the same for being in a call centre or, you know, any kind of alienated job you want to think of. And what this results in is that people don't just go to work, but in so doing, they also transform themselves in various negative ways. So that you get very good at doing the same boring activity over and over again and develop back pain and become really depressed. And that's a consequence of the kinds of activity or daily engaging in on a daily basis and how it's developing you as a person. While if a worker was free, then they would be engaging activities which positively develop them. So for example, you're choosing to learn how to cook by engaging in the activity. In so doing, you're getting better at cooking, acquiring uh, new interests and different kinds of recipes that before you hadn't been. 
and thereby becoming a more developed version of yourself than if you'd never learned how to cook. And a lot of anarchists would then connect this commitment to human development to the other conceptions of freedom. So Bakunin thinks that given the kind of animals humans are, you're only able to really develop yourself if you're living in accordance with your will rather than being subject to the will of another. And I think a lot of people have experienced this with respect to school. There are things at school which you're learning which you don't like just because of the compulsory situation you're in in which an authority figure is ordering you to engage in this activity and develop these skills and therefore children resent that and don't learn. Rudolf Rocker defines uh, freedom in terms of having the real possibility to, to develop yourself. So you, individuals are more free, the more opportunities they have to develop themselves. And so he kind of connects those two views. And there are anarchists who don't define freedom in terms of human development, but they still value it. So Emma Goldman argues that freedom creates the situation in which humans can develop themselves rather than defining freedom in terms of that or Malatesta defines happiness as the full development of one's faculties rather than defining freedom in that manner. So often with anarchists, even if they don't use one of these definitions of freedom, they still think it's important to being free or to having a worthwhile life. They just don't always label it uh, as freedom. So I'm talking a lot about freedom, but what about equality and solidarity? Well, anarchists thought that humans were social animals by nature, it's just the kind of animal we are. And given this, we can't be free outside of a social context. And in order for society to be free over an extended period of time, it has to be structured in such a manner that it both enables the freedom of the individuals who comprise it and prevents individuals from being able to oppress others. And they thought that in order to actually achieve that in the real world, you need egalitarian social relations, and you need solidarity between individuals. So they mainly focus on two different kinds of equality. So the first kind is equality of self-determination. What this means is that each individual is free to live in accordance with their own will, but they're not free to impose their will on another through coercion. So you're free to self-direct your life, but you're not free to dominate anyone else because that would violate the equal freedom of everyone else to self-direct their life. Therefore, the only condition under which you can, say, use coercion against another person is in self-defense or to prevent them from dominating another person. And that's in order to guarantee the equal freedom of everyone to not be subject to oppression. And the second aspect of equality of self-determination is to do with the structure of organizations. And anarchists thought that they had to be structured in a horizontal rather than a hierarchical manner so that there's no division between rulers who make decisions and subordinates who do as instructed and lack decision-making power. Instead, they wanted horizontal organizations in which each member has an equal say in decisions which affect them and they co-determine the organization with every other member. And the primary means for which anarchists did this historically and today is through general assemblies where you have a bunch of people together in a room and they discuss various proposals um, and then vote on them and then there are different views about how to go about doing that but the point is that there's no personal group of people who's ordering everyone else about instead they're equals who co-determine the actions they take as a group rather than there being a situation of minority rule or conversely the tyranny of the majority now the second kind of equality anarchists focused on was equality of opportunity which meant a situation in which each individual has equal access to the external conditions necessary for them to have the real possibility to do and be various things. Um, so everyone should have access to food, shelter, housing, healthcare and so on. And that equality is necessary for individuals to be free because if people don't have equal access to the means of existence, then that will create a situation in which you have people who do have access to those resources using that power to impose their will on other people. And so in order to prevent a new form of class society developing, anarchists thought you needed to have this equality of opportunity. That's a pressing question, isn't it? It's a pressing question for the West, because actually most people in the world don't have... By solidarity, anarchists meant two different kinds of social relation. The first consisted in individuals cooperating with one another in pursuit of a common goal. And they thought this form of cooperation was really important because it's the means through which the external conditions 
that are necessary for people to engage in activity or develop themselves are created. So for example, an individual might want to paint and be an artist, but they can't do that unless there's an economy based on corporation, which produces and distributes the necessary materials for them to be an artist. And so if you think of freedom in terms of human development or having the real possibility to do and be various things, then you need this corporation in order to make that individual free to be an artist. And this is the case for everything, right? It's the case you know, for food, it's the case for, say, schools um, needing public infrastructure, which is produced, which enables them to run the school, like, say, having electricity or having tables to use. And in the absence of that, their ability to give children the opportunity to learn and grow won't be there. And then the school itself has to cooperate in order to educate kids in a way that is based on freedom and not based on domination and so on. The second kind of social relation that anarchists focused on when it came to solidarity was individuals forming reciprocal caring relationships in which each individual acts to ensure the ongoing freedom and equality of those around them. So the idea is, is that in order to be in a position where you can learn to self-determine or uh, be able to develop yourself, then you need to have been treated with you know, love and respect by the individuals in your life. And so you need, say, supportive parents, you need um, friends who treat you as an equal, you need, say, sexual partners who don't oppress you and, you know, look and, and care and look after you. And that this is crucial for maintaining freedom over time. So, for example, if someone oppresses you, there will be other humans who will come to your defense and look after you or help you heal from that oppression that you experience. But also about learning how to act as a free individual. So, for example, if you're subject to an authoritarian uh, parent who orders you about all the time when you're a child, then instead of learning how to self-determine, you learn how to obey and do as instructed, which means when you're an adult, you don't have the real possibility to engage in free actions because you're just used to constantly deferring to authority figures to make all your kind of life decisions for you. And that's not just a way in which you're made unfree, but it's also a way in which you're not given the social situation in which you can learn how to live as a free human being. Uh, and so therefore you need these relationships of mutual support and care in order to enable people to become uh, free agents who can then create and reproduce a, a wider free society outside of, say, their you know family or uh, intimate circle of friends. So that's the anarchist value system where you've got freedom, quality and solidarity, and you need all, th all three at once in order for any one of them to be realized. And that's because when anarchists think about these things, they're not thinking abstractly. They're thinking about concrete social relations between individuals and how we can actually organize and associate with one another in order to really realize them in our daily lives, in you know, numerous and never-ending interactions we have with other human beings during the course of our lives. What we have to give up in order to ensure that you know, we're not going to the One of the main things I've researched is the revolutionary strategy advocated by the historic anarchist movement. The broad commitment of the strategy was that they advocated the simultaneous abolition of capitalism and the state at the same time. So they didn't think we should overthrow capitalism and then the state, or the state then capitalism, we have to do both together. And they thought this because of how capitalism and the state mutually reinforce one another, such that a new kind of economic organisation requires a new kind of political organisation and the other way around. And they thought in order to achieve this objective, you're going to have to launch a social revolution, which fundamentally restructures all human social relationships, both at the large scale with, say, how the entire economy is organised, but also at the small scale in terms of, you know, how parents relate with kids, how um, men and women relate to one another, about uh, how different people in a kind of micro level relate. And so you have to transform both large scale social structures and small intimate social structures in order for a genuine full social revolution to be achieved. And that a crucial part of that social revolution is launching a armed insurrection, which forcibly expropriates the means of production from the ruling classes and then establishes federations of workplace and community general assemblies in which workers are able to uh, self-determine uh, their lives through these systems of organization and decision-making. And 
there was then lots of debate within the anarchist movement about, well, how do we achieve this armed insurrection? And there were lots of different views, and I'll just briefly discuss two of the main ones before going on to kind of anarchist views on, on state socialism and prefigurative politics. So one view was that anarchists should engage in small armed uprisings, which would inspire other workers to revolt, and this would then be repressed, and that repression would in turn inspire other people to come out in anger over police and state brutality, and you'd get this kind of snowball effect where what was originally this small insurrection grows and grows and inspires more and more people until it has become a revolutionary situation. And you can kind of see where they're coming from if you say look at you know, recent uh, protests in America where in response to how the police acted, more people came out to protest. Or you can look at the Arab Spring where people in different countries were inspired to rise up against different oppressive regimes because people in other countries in the same region were also doing this. It didn't end up uh, working <laughs> uh, for the anarchists. The different attempts they made at implementing this strategy end up being defeated very quickly before they could really uh, snowball uh, in this way. And so a number of other anarchists at the same time, and also in response to this kind of failure of this initial strategy, uh, ended up thinking that we need to first generate a mass working class movement. And then once that mass working class movement is generated, we then have a social force which is capable of launching an uprising that won't be immediately brutally repressed by the state and not end up uh, leading to a revolutionary situation. And then they thought that in order to generate that mass movement, we have to engage in struggles for immediate reforms, such as uh, strikes for increased wages or uh, rent strikes for lower rent, as well as issues in wider society like um, abortion rights, for example. And it was thought that workers would join these struggles for immediate reforms based on their immediate interests, like, I want to be paid more by my boss, or I don't want to work in a really unsafe workplace. And so they would join a social movement based on these immediate interests in improving their lives. But then during the struggle, to achieve these reforms, they would be transformed for engaging in direct action, and they would be radicalised, and they would go from merely wanting to improve their situation within capitalism to being part of a social movement which is explicitly aimed at abolishing capitalism. And this is what um, different kinds of syndicalist trade unions um, attempted to do. In Spain, they were able to reach a point where they did generate a social movement that did then launch an armed insurrection in 1936 in response to an attempt at a fascist coup and were able to defeat that coup in Barcelona and create a um, revolutionary situation. And then they end up, for various reasons, being militarily um, defeated. But the premise of generating a mass social movement for struggles for reform, which then becomes a revolutionary movement, was something that they were able to do, even if they weren't able, uh, for a variety of complex reasons I won't go into, to actually overthrow capitalism state, because as you might have noticed, uh, capitalism the state, unfortunately, uh, still exists. Now, in advocating these strategies based on direct action, uh, simultaneously overthrowing capitalism the state, uh, and then different views on how to create uh, that social revolution, anarchists had views which were very different to state socialists at the time, and what these state socialists thought was that one of the main ways we can build up a revolutionary movement is through engaging in uh, elections within parliament and that we can use the platform of parliamentary debate and discussion to spread socialist ideas and recruit people into this party that's revolutionary. Anarchists thought that if a social movement engages in parliamentarianism, what will end up happening is that the movement will become reformist over time and cease to be revolutionary. So if you struggle for immediate improvements through direct action, that's a radical means that's against existing oppressive institutions. But if you try to win reforms by entering into the existing state and pass uh, laws in parliament, what's going to end up happening is that members of that social movement will end up being entangled with the state and go from being opposed to the existing state to wanting to preserve it, to viewing it as an important way to achieve social change, 
uh, and then they'll become less and less radical over time until they don't even want the abolition of capitalism anymore and they just want kind of small improvements within capitalism. And this is in fact what ended up happening to state socialist parties which attempted to do this. The anarchist prediction came true. And the other anarchist prediction was that if you go for the kind of insurrectionary state socialist approach where we're just going to try to forcibly seize state power and transform into a worker state. Anarchists didn't think this would be able to create a socialist society because given that the state is a hierarchical, centralised organisation wielded by a small minority of people who actually make decisions, the state can't be seized by workers as a whole. Instead, what will happen is it will be seized by representatives who will actually end up making decisions. And those representatives, even if they're elected, will end up developing distinct interests of their own, opposed to the wider working class. Therefore, you can't use state power to achieve a classless society because it's constituted by a means that will result in the ends of minority rule by a small group of people, rather than the self-determination of workers as a whole, which is what socialism uh, aims for. Now, what underpinned this strategic commitment was what's called the unity of means and ends. The means you engage in determine the ends you arrive at, irrespective of your intentions. And given this, you have to engage in forms of activity which develop people into the kinds of individuals who are capable of and are driven to construct and reproduce the end goal of an anarchist society. So if you use the means of a hierarchical organisation, people within that organisation will just learn how to engage in hierarchical activity and thereby there will never come a point where they'll suddenly totally transform everything and create an egalitarian society. Instead what will end up happening is it will just reproduce itself over time and what was once a means, this hierarchical organisation, becomes the end. You have a hierarchical society even though that's not what you originally set out to do. Given this, anarchists were committed to what's now called prefigurative politics, although historically they didn't use this label. During the struggle against capitalism and the state, you have to create kinds of organisation which are as close as possible to what would exist in an actual functioning anarchist society. So, if we want to create a society in which workers self-determine their lives in workplace and community assemblies, then we should create social movements in the present, which also make decisions through these general assemblies. And as a result, when workers participate in these movements, they're not just struggling against capitalism and the state, but they're also transforming themselves in various respects, and they're learning how to make decisions and learning to want to make decisions in a way that is the same uh, as what would exist in anarchist society. Now, historically, anarchists tended to mainly focus on how to structure organisations and how to make decisions. So you should have federations, they should be decentralised, you should make uh, decisions in which people as a group collectively determine things rather than a minority tell everyone what to do. They should be voluntary uh, associations. But there were broader considerations when it came to prefiguring a future anarchist society. A good example is schools. Uh, anarchist social movements all across the world created uh, anarchist schools which were meant to provide the kinds of free education that would exist in an anarchist society. And in doing this, anarchists weren't saying what we're doing now is definitely what will exist in the future. Instead, they were trying to ex engage in a process of experimentation where we've grown up in an oppressive society. We don't know how to live like people in anarchist society would, but we can try and experiment with different ways of living freely and through a process of trial and error, arrive at ways of uh, existing which are more free and more like an anarchist society uh, than what currently exists. Another example would be uh, sexual relationships. So historic anarchists generally rejected marriage as a Christian religious ceremony in favour of free love. Each person was free to leave whenever they wanted. There was no religious ceremony. Uh, they weren't recognised by the state as a married couple. So how I think my research is relevant to contemporary anarchist practice is that it's important to read what anarchists in the past thought 
For a variety of reasons. So firstly, it means we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of insights in historic anarchists, which I think are still relevant today. Like, I think they're right that in order to be free, individuals also need to be equal and bonded together through relations of solidarity. And that can be a lot of effort to figure out by oneself. And I can then say, read Malatesta or Emma Goldman, and it's already all there. And I can go, oh, great, that's a really good idea. I'm going to... Um, advocate that. And I think this is especially a case with the unity of means and ends. I think that is a really important insight which needs to be at the core of everything anarchists do today. And I think we can build and improve on the historic anarchist movement by incorporating that insight into more and more aspects of our social movement and our lives, such as, unlike a lot of historic anarchists, you know, if we want to create a free society, we have to relate freely with people in the present. And that means, say, not being sexist, not being racist, not being homophobic, rather than, say, just focusing on, like, class politics in a you know, kind of narrow economic sense. And so even though I spend a lot of time reading dead people and think we should read them, I'm not saying that we should kind of, like, blindly repeat what they said. And whenever we have arguments, be like, well, Bakunin said this, and therefore you should agree with what he said because he's this famous dead anarchist. Like, I reject that view. I more think that they have a lot of insight while also giving us a lot of space in which to reflect on lessons we can learn from their own failures. So we can look at historic sexism in the uh, anarchist movement and then use that to reflect about contemporary sexism uh, in the anarchist movement and ways in which we can try to navigate that based on how people in the past also tried to improve that situation. So, for example, there were anarchist feminists who created dedicated women's organisations. They wrote newspapers in which they would critique sexist men in the movement and they would agitate directly for women's issues like abortion rights. And I think that can be an inspiration for a modern uh, anarchist feminist about, you know, people in the past have faced similar issues to you. They also try to overcome them and so can you. And this sense of, I find it's less isolating when you know that people in the past had similar beliefs and similar issues to confront that we do in the present. Or at least for me, it makes it easier to navigate knowing that I'm kind of not alone in this. 